Hi, this is Caroline Lewis, and I just wanted to let you know that our Working Preacher Spring Campaign is in full swing. We are grateful to each of you who have given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors to provide new content each week. If you make a gift before May 31st, your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. You can go to workingpreacher.org today and make your gift to help continue this important resource for preachers around the globe. As a special thank you, at the end of this campaign, all Working Preacher donors will receive access to a set of recordings from the 2021 Festival of Homiletics by Sermon Brainwavers. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for May 16th, 2021, the seventh Sunday of Easter, are Acts 1, 15 through 17, and 21 through 26, Psalm 1, 1 John 5, 9 through 13, and John 17, 6 through 19. We still miss our friend and co-podcaster, Joy J. Moore, but we uh, hope she'll be back with us soon. Until then, you're stuck with the three of us. And John, yes. we are still working yes. our way through John's Easter visit. Yes, which is always John the case. always comes to visit during Easter time. John yeah. does. That's because John doesn't get John's own year, so John has to show up in some. Important year B is places. the year of John. Year. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. All right. So we have what is uh, typically called the high priestly prayer. Uh, and we uh, usually every year note uh, how different this prayer is compared to uh, the synoptics, uh, where the disciples overhear uh, this prayer. Uh, they're not sleeping and Jesus is not off on a rock uh, somewhere asking for uh, the cup to be taken away, but is, is embodying and demonstrating prayer uh, at a really key point in, in his life. And that's right before he will be arrested. Uh, and uh, and in, in his arrest, he'll say, shall I not drink the cup? Uh, but we have the middle portion of the prayer here. Uh, the prayer is I think, and I say this every year too, that the preacher needs to have the whole prayer in mind so that you know uh, where you've come from and where you are going. Uh, this is the middle portion of the prayer. And that's the weird thing about the lectionary is that we hear the whole prayer over three years. <laughs> and so uh, my recommendation is that you, that you, you know, you choose a place to jump down or drop down into this passage, but you really have in mind the entire prayer. The first part of the prayer, Jesus prays for himself uh, and what, uh, and his, his own ministry and what is about uh, to occur. This, this portion of the prayer, he is uh, praying specifically for his, uh, for his disciples uh, and, and handing them their care over to God. And then uh, the last portion of the prayer, 20 and 20, 20 to 26, Jesus is praying for believers yet to be. And so that, that movement of the prayer is something maybe that we, that we pay attention to. Uh, that, uh, and particularly when uh, there is no Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of John, uh, that what, what, does this, what does this prayer mean for a model of prayer? Uh, and, and maybe it's that movement, or maybe it's that, that, that sectionality of myself, my immediate community, and, um, and the world that can become a kind of, 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 of way of entry into what prayer means and how it functions. So I like the focus, though, on, on his people for, the, for this segment. I, I wonder, uh, well, Claudio Carvalho's in his commentary zeroes in on this for a little bit, this notion of the world and not belonging to the world. And I wonder, I, part of me wants to hear a, a, a really good sermon this year that helps me make sense of that in verse 16, that helps people understand the church's relationship to the world. That's not a kind of simplistic, well, we don't share any of the world's values, because that's just not true, I don't think, or something that makes out the world to be 
some evil monster that you know that's that's always to be feared or always to be avoided or something i mean i just want to know more about that notion of the world that he's talking about here because i think people hear this verse and sometimes it causes trouble sometimes that's for ecological reasons but i think i'm more worried about the ways in which the church tries to navigate its space in public um, especially these days and we're recording this far in advance of May 16th, I should point out, and I have no idea what May is going to look like in where we live in the Twin Cities. Uh, and, and how, but you know, this keeps coming up, obviously, right? How does the church responsibly engage a world where we want to see change, we want to see justice, we want to distinguish ourselves from the world, we also recognize complicity with the world. Does this verse mean anything? Does this passage mean anything this year? Well, I, I, I think that's, yeah, that's an important point, uh, Matt, because one then has to recognize the distinctiveness of how John is using this term, world or cosmos, um, cosmos, and that the world in John represents uh, a, whether it's people or space or you know institutions or whatever, uh, of, of resistance or uh, rejection or unwillingness or uh, incapacity to recognize the revelation of God and Jesus. So it's not it's it, it, it and so th this letter this letter portion of this lection it's it's really pointing to how the disciples are going to be called to live and work. To bear fruit, to do the work, you know, to the, do the work of Jesus, to be the I am in the world, amidst amidst opposition. Uh, but it's not it's it's not that it's taking them out of the world because it's up to them to make John three sixteen come true. Uh, and that's you know, so you, you we do have to go back to John three sixteen for God so loved the world, and then of course in John twenty, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. You know, how is the how is the world going to experience uh, this presence of God and Jesus without us embodying that in the world? Uh, but it's recognizing that that's going to be uh, that's going to be resisted or rejected, which goes back to. What happens after John three sixteen? Uh, that uh, that this is this is the judgment. This is the crisis moment. That the light has that the light shines in the world, and that and and we don't see the light. So it's not. Um, does that make sense? It's not so much that the world is bad, and it's not so much that and it, that we exist in a kind of space that is you know that we're not in the world we are in the world but it's specifically what that world represents for john anyway thanks uh that's really helpful but isn't it also true in john i mean as continuing after john three sixteen, um you know i come not into the world for judgment because it's already judged that is that there's a there is a conditional problem uh, uh, not a conditional problem there's a problem of the condition of the world which is why Jesus comes out of love for the world, but that uh, the world is in John's theology, right, Carolyn? How, how, well, how would you put it? Let me just ask you. How would I put what? What is oh. the what is the condition in the world that Jesus comes to save? Uh, well, the the condition in the world um, is one could say sin. But mm -hmm. sin, very specifically, sin as separation from God, or and from uh, Jesus, and from Jesus. So not being in a relationship uh, with with God or with Jesus, and so uh, so that's the the and so that concept of salvation then uh, really kind of gets solidified. Well, it, it actually. It, it is stated in the prayer, John seventeen three. This is eternal life that you may know me and know the Father. That's salvation. Uh, salvation is not accomplished uh, on the cross. Salvation is, uh, is, this, is this movement of God to, all, to the world to, uh, in, to in, invite into this abiding intimate relationship. Um, does that? Yep, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, well put. I almost want to say, Caroline, say that again, but uh, 
I can just rewind it and listen again. <laughs> the, uh, I, I think there's one other element of Christian mission here or the mission uh, on which Jesus sends the church that uh, is evident throughout and that it's, it can be dangerous. So in, in Acts 10, you know, Luke 10, rather, you know, I, I send you out a sheep in the midst of wolves or here, you know, I am sending, the, I'm sending them in the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Um, that there is part of the astonishing uh, nature of, of the willingness of the disciples to be sent was they knew they were being sent out in danger. And so you do have, you know, um, stories and acts uh, in some ways uh, capture this. Correct, Matt? Story of acts. See what I did there? Yeah, but stories and acts that are dangerous. Yeah. You want me I mean, to decide? Are we going to acts now? Yeah, we're going to actually, you know. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah, I missed my cue. <laughs> yeah, you missed your cue. That's sorry. Um, Matt, um, how do, go ahead. <laughs> Looking at Acts 1, uh, happy ascension to everybody. And this isn't really about the ascension, but this no. is what you have to do after the ascension. You got to get 12. So you need to, you know, this. So it's a weird passage. But I would say it has some connections, I think, to John 17, uh, to be honest, in terms of um, the idea of threat, because there is a memory here about Judas that comes up. We, the death of Judas is, is edited out of the lection, but you do have this reminder that the church is organizing itself here still in the shadow of some treachery uh, with reminders of that. But then this organization isn't because, you know, we got to have 12, we got to have the perfect number. It, it's, it's more they're gearing themselves, gearing, girding themselves for action, which is what Jesus told them to do. So that's very, uh, it's important to remember. The other thing that's really important to remember is Acts in general uh, is a story about Christ's ministry continuing after his death and ascension. I could give a little mini lecture about that, but I'll spare you all. But this is what the book is mostly about and not the, not how the church works in Christ's absence, but how Christ remains present in the life and the work of the church. And of course, we'll mark that next weekend on Pentecost uh, in all of its splendor. But for here, there's a reminder, I think that that's what's going on and that's what they're gearing themselves up for. So I would focus on that. You might need to say a few things about casting lots and whose idea that was, but I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of choosing my leaders by casting lots. I prefer way more reliable means like voting. All committees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like majority rule, because that really works well in a lot of churches, doesn't it? Yeah, not but so anyway. well. Say, I, my trivia, uh, which I know that's... Um, not really helpful, but is I've been to the tomb of Matthias, Matthias, in uh, Tr the supposed in Trier, Germany, the oldest Christian settlement, and the the abbot of the monastery uh, took uh, me and one other person down. We got the secret backstage pass to go down and see the supposed tomb of Matthias. But there's an old interpretation of Acts. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to ridicule it, Matt. But I kind of wonder if it, even though it's probably not. At, actually accurate if it might not be heuristically valuable like you just said drawing lots is not the best way to choose leaders and it's sort of like this is how this is how they chose the 12th apostle or disciple but then really the acts is a lot about paul and so maybe the spirit actually chose paul but um i know you, you're gonna think yeah that's kind of a dumb interpretation I, I i think that for as far as acts is concerned that matthias is the 12th apostle because uh, Paul never calls himself an apostle in Acts. Acts only refers to him as an apostle twice in, um, in chapter 14 and Barnabas with him as well. And so I, I'm not so sure that, that Acts wants to make a lot of Paul having that title. I, I do want to say one more thing about the selection is one of the things that makes this rather obscure passage important is it's a, it's a reminder that Jesus' followers throughout the Gospels were more than just Jesus and his, his, and his 12 mm -hmm. bros, that there were uh, other people who were among the ministry from the beginning. Here we learn names of two more who we don't know anything else about. But of course, we also know that there were women among that group from Acts 8, 1 to 3 and other places. Um, I think even in Acts 1, where there's mention of 120 people, Mary is named again elsewhere in Acts 1. 
what's peculiar about this is that when they tried to figure out who should we nominate, apparently only men were eligible for that. Now that's not going to surprise most people in churches, oh, but it's yeah. worth pointing out that this is about more. Than... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> my mansplaining again. Uh, no, but no, it's worth not... pointing out that what looks like a divine choice has already been vetted by human beings nominating. Well, these are obviously the only two who are qualified for the job, right? And we might um, justly criticize that. Caroline, do you have anything you want to say about that? I don't know. Let me, I, I'd like to say I one thing first. Problem. <laughs> I'd like to say one thing first, and that just to notice for uh, for the for people who don't know Greek, um, in 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 verse sixteen when it says friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled. That's not the same word as friends that we had in John last week. Philos. This is uh, Adelph. Actually, it says men brothers in Greek. Uh, and so it it it, re it emphasizes what you just said, Matt, but it's also, I just want people not not to assume this is like a continuation of that friendship theme. Uh, so the NRSV often, um, for the, when Adelphoi, in, in brethren in the old translation or brothers, uh, to, to, to de-gender that, they often will either say brothers and sisters or they will say friends, the NRSV. Yeah, I, I think the only other thing I want to say about what we've been talking about and the, perhaps the connections between Acts and John is uh, that, that these verses in, in John 17 uh, and, and kind of like uh, the you know, making sure we've got all the disciples all set in, in Acts, uh, you get this language in John of, of being sanctified uh, or set apart. Uh, and 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 then and then being sent, which is uh, which is exactly what Jesus says about himself in ten thirty six. Uh, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, and that set apart or that sanctification is a is a, perhaps a another way to think about. Um, to think about God's presence or Jesus' presence uh, that uh, of a protection or uh, it's not that they're like super duper special. <laughs> it's you know like ooh set apart you're you're super special. It's this it's this way of understanding or way of saying uh, that uh, that that God's God's presence or Jesus' presence remains in that sentness. Uh, and, and of course that will be the, the, the Holy spirit as well. But, um, I don't know, that just might be one, another. Very helpful. And we should probably point out too, that the larger story of acts as well as the larger story of the church has been the spirit choosing to work through whoever the spirit wants to work through. And yeah. The, yeah. so even the church's delineation of these 12 men, uh, is going to come back to surprise them in the pages of acts, uh, more so in the history of the church. Yeah. Anything you want to say about the Psalm, Rolf? Uh, I want to say a lot about the psalm. You do? Yes, this week. Okay. Shock. Psalm um, 1. This also, like, don't we have, like, Psalm 1 every other month? Uh, it does not occur as often as Psalm 23, no. Mm. Um, and. Not that that's bad. I mean, I like Psalm 1. It's fine. <laughs> well, I love saying. Psalm 1, and I love Clint McCann. Clint McCann uh, is one of my most, uh, he's one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, period, and especially one of my favorite Psalm scholars. I love Clint, and uh, he, uh, what he does in this passage is especially he focuses on the two ways of Psalm one, really two roads. Uh, uh, you know, I think um, you know. So it starts off um, a happy, and he really he really focuses on um, the translation of that word is happy. Uh, which uh, it's probably not the best translation, but it's still, I love what he says. So let me come back to that. But this, oh, uh, there's two main metaphors in the Psalm. And I kind of, uh, your high school English teacher might've said, don't mix metaphors, but someone didn't take Mr. Fox for high school English. So uh, there's the two ways, the two roads. And so the book of Psalms starts with here, here's two ways to live your life. Choose uh, and don't choose poorly. But it also starts off with the image of the tree. Jim Lindbergh in his commentary on Psalms says, the book of Psalms is full of pictures and the first picture in the Psalter is of the tree. And so uh, the, the, uh, it, the metaphor is this, as water is to a healthy tree, so are the scriptures, the Torah, 
to a healthy spiritual life that um, root yourself, ground yourself deeply in the, the scriptures uh, for they will give life. And at the end, Clint has this lovely, uh, I, I love this phrase. He says, the promise of Psalm 1, reinforced by Jesus and Paul, is that the God-directed and neighbor-oriented way is the most rewarding and happiness-producing life possible. I love that. God-directed and neighbor-oriented life. And now you guys can rejoin the podcast. Why, thank you. Well, I love that too. And, and to name that as it's rewarding and happiness producing that, you know, that there's a, uh, we're, we're not looking for altruism here. <laughs> you can, you can be somebody who tries to maximize the goodness of your own life and live that kind of way. I mean, that's, that's the, well, I, I, a lot of Deuteronomy says similar things, right? That this is, you know, God says, I've set before you two ways. One's going to be really good for you. One's going to be really bad for you. Choose life. Good luck. Choose wisely. Yeah, or as Deuteronomy says, choose life. Mm -hmm. Which is a lovely segue to our last reading. Oh, I thought we were and... going to talk about breakfast cereal. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I do like that cereal a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've yeah the last reading, like... though. Um... But the last reading, it's a good segue to, uh, to the portion of this final uh, lection from First John. And Beth, uh, Beth is stealing a page out of our playbook. She wants so? to add verses. Oh, yeah. In the I commentary. Know. Exactly. Yes. Uh, my classmate from uh, Luther Seminary back in the day. Thank you very much, Beth, for this commentary. But, uh, but verse 11, and this is the testimony. This is the witness. Uh, God gave us eternal life, and this life is in uh, God's Son. And, uh, and that, 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 you know, that, that, what does eternal life mean uh, is again, this, there is, uh, how do I want to say this, this, this life that is abundant uh, because of God's abundance of love given in God's son. And so, uh, you know, when we're looking for, what is it that we, what, what is it that we give witness to? And what is it that we testify to? Uh, that this that this eternal life is not this abstract uh, promise of you know uh, mansions in the in the sky somewhere, is that that it this life is in Jesus. It's connected to Jesus. It cannot not be without Jesus, and uh, and and that's that's what we're invited to give witness to. Mm -hmm.